Hello, and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver, and I'm a scientist, and back there is Cindy Oliver, and she's a dog. Recently, I've been getting an awful lot of comments asking me about a video Dr. John Campbell made about a study out of Israel looking at myocarditis and pericarditis associated with COVID. Some are asking nicely, some not so nicely, but there is definitely quite a bit of interest in the subject. So here's a video about it. Now, my first thought when the comments started was, surely he hasn't made a video about the Israeli study that anti-vaxxers were misrepresenting months ago. So I decided to take a look. And it turned out that, yes, he was. So let's have a look at what he said. So the COVID group did not have more myocarditis and pericarditis than the group who'd never had the COVID infections. And this is completely regardless of the vaccination. It's before the vaccinations were being uh, were introduced. Now, why don't more countries look at similar studies? Because we've got large cohorts of people who had COVID and didn't have COVID before there was vaccination. It's such an obvious study to do. And this groups, this, these groups in Israel have done it from University of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem to main medical universities in Israel. Now, we are seeing more pericarditis and myocarditis around at the moment. So from this data, it would appear from this data that the source of this increased amount of myocarditis and pericarditis is not COVID infection per se, not the COVID infection itself. And I think you can see the import of that statement that I've just made. So Dr. Campbell is making three false insinuations here. Firstly, his claim that the study shows that there is no association between COVID and myocarditis and pericarditis is false. Secondly, he suggested that no one else has done these studies is also false. And his third nudge, nudge, wink, wink claim that someone else, carrots maybe, must be causing the increase in myocarditis and pericarditis cases is also false because the first claim that they are not associated with COVID is false. And incidentally, he doesn't actually provide any evidence to show that there has been an increase in myocarditis and pericarditis cases. I'm not saying there hasn't been, but he is making this claim without providing evidence to back it up. So let's start with the middle claim that no one else has looked at the subject. In fact, a number of studies have looked at the association between COVID and myocarditis and pericarditis. I won't take you through all of them because it would get a bit boring, but this meta-analysis here summarises the results of some of them. And in fact, in this meta-analysis, they have looked at the incidence of myocarditis associated with COVID and the incidence associated with vaccination. And this is what they found. If anyone is not familiar with meta-analyses, this figure is what is known as a forest plot. And it shows the results of each study analysed in blue, as well as the overall result when the, when the results are combined in red. If a result is to the right of the vertical line and the error bar doesn't cross the line, it means there is an association between myocarditis and the intervention. So if we look first at COVID, we can see that all studies show that there was an association between COVID and myocarditis. And the combined effect has a risk ratio of 14.82, which means you are 14.82 times more likely to get myocarditis if you get COVID than if you don't. There is also an increase after vaccination, which has, of course, been well publicised. 
but the risk ratio is much lower at 1.95. This means there is a seven times greater chance of getting myocarditis after COVID infection than after COVID vaccination. So why would the study out of Israel that Campbell has covered be showing COVID isn't associated with myocarditis and pericarditis? Well, the simple answer is that it isn't. This is a study here. It's published in an MDPI journal called the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And like most articles in MDPI journals, it had a remarkably quick peer review process. But I'd like to draw your attention to the title. The incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis in post-COVID-19 unvaccinated patients, a large population-based study. The key word here is post. They are not looking at the incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis associated with COVID. They are looking at the incidence in people who have already recovered from COVID. Specifically, the post-COVID timeframe was defined from at least 10 days after the date of positive PCR tests contingent upon lack of symptoms related to COVID infection, according to the definitions of the Israeli Ministry of Health. In other words, they were only looking at people who had completely recovered from COVID. And indeed, if you read the paper, they specifically state that COVID is associated with myocarditis and pericarditis in the acute state, but they are looking at the post-COVID period. And their conclusion is that there is no association in this post-COVID period. Is this conclusion correct? Well, not according to this much larger study, which was conducted for a longer period of time and published in Nature Medicine. I have covered this study before. They looked at cardiovascular complications over a period of 12 months following COVID for veterans in the US. And they compared the risk with two sets of control cohorts, an historical cohort from before the pandemic, and a contemporary cohort of people with no evidence of SARS-CoV-2. And altogether, they looked at 11,650,818 people. And this is what they found. People who recovered from COVID had an increased risk of both myocarditis and pericarditis over the next 12 months. They also found an increased risk of a bunch of other cardiovascular conditions as well, but they're not particularly relevant to this video. But you can always look at my other videos if you want to know more about them. So why are the results from the US study so different than the results from the Israeli study? Well, the authors of the Israeli study have this suggestion. Similar to our study, Zia Tao showed that individuals with COVID-19 infection are at increased risk of cardiovascular complications 30 days after infection, including pericarditis and myocarditis, regardless of the need for hospitalization. Comparable with our study, the study population was tested for risk of inflammatory heart diseases, regardless of previous SARS-CoV-2 vaccination. Yet, in contrast, in the study by Z et al., the tested cohort was homogenous, comprising of US Department of Veteran Affairs with male predominance and young age. The difference in the population characteristics may explain the, dis the dissimilarity between the results of the studies as young males are known to exhibit a higher incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis. Well, that 
that kind of sounds plausible. Only problem is it's not true. Although the US study definitely had our male skew, it didn't have our younger age skew. Just the opposite, in fact. The average age of COVID participants in the Israeli study was 42 years, whereas the average age in the US study was 61 years. Furthermore, they did a number of subgroup analyses in the US study. And they showed that the increased risk of inflammatory heart diseases remained, regardless of age and sex. And as you can see, they also looked at a number of other subgroups as well. So feel free to pause the video and peruse them if you wish. So strike that as a reason. What else could it be? Well, there's a hint in the paper's limitations. Our current study has several limitations. First, although the potential number of participants who were considered for inclusion was large, the number of cases of myocarditis and pericarditis was small. This was mainly attributed to the limitation of a relatively short follow-up period due to initiation of the massive vaccination program. Second, we included only cases of hospitalised myocarditis or pericarditis patients, whereas outpatient medical records were excluded from the study. This could possibly omit a small number of patients with mild disease. Furthermore, we included our diagnosis of myocarditis and pericarditis according to the medical records without access to patient-based information regarding confirmation of the diagnosis. So the paper has quite a few limitations that were identified by the authors, which may be affecting the results. It also has quite a few more that the authors haven't discussed, but we'll get to them later. First, let's look at what they have identified and what Dr. Campbell seems to have missed. Uh, there it is, 196,922. So that was the uh, patients who had it. They compared those against a larger group, over half a million who hadn't. These are the sort of numbers that <laughs> researchers dream of. You get very, very good data from these kind of numbers. Well, John's certainly impressed. I'm not so easily impressed because I looked at this figure here, which makes it clear that the big numbers that impressed John are only for people who were followed up for 18 days. When we get out to six months, the numbers drop to 30,705 post-COVID participants and 92,105 uninfected participants not such a large group. In fact, if we compare the Israeli study with the US study in terms of patient months or patient years, we see that the US study is 52 times larger in size. As I mentioned though, there are a number of limitations that the authors haven't identified. So let's have a look at some of them. The authors state that they use the following diagnostic codes for myocarditis and pericarditis. Now, if you're not familiar with IC10 codes, you might assume that these are the only codes for myocarditis and pericarditis. But that assumption would be wrong. This pretty slide here shows some of the IC10 codes for myocarditis and pericarditis. And what I've done is I've put blue boxes around the codes that the authors included and pink boxes around the codes that they haven't included. So for myocarditis, they've included acute myocarditis, acute myocarditis unspecified and myocarditis unspecified. 
but they didn't include viral myocarditis, infective myocarditis, isolated myocarditis, other acute myocarditis, and myocarditis in diseases classified elsewhere. There's also a bunch of other myocarditis codes that they didn't include as well, but I couldn't fit them all on the page. Now for pericarditis, they included acute pericarditis and acute pericarditis unspecified. But they didn't include viral pericarditis, acute nonspecific idiopathic pericarditis, infective pericarditis, other forms of acute pericarditis, chronic adhesive pericarditis, chronic constrictive pericarditis, and pericarditis in diseases classified elsewhere. So what this means, for instance, if someone who had COVID gets myocarditis and it is coded as infective myocarditis or viral myocarditis because their doctor knows from their records that they have recently had COVID, this case won't be counted in the numbers. So while the title of the paper suggests that they have looked at all forms of myocarditis and pericarditis, they have actually just looked at a subset of cases. No wonder they didn't find many cases. The next issue relates to the control group. To be included in the control group, participants had to have had at least one negative COVID test. At first glance, this seems a reasonable criteria. Until you consider that a key reason for getting a COVID test is because you have symptoms that resemble COVID. Now, these people probably didn't have COVID because they tested negative, but they most likely had some other type of infection that was causing their symptoms, either an infection with a different virus or a bacterial infection. And a key cause of myocarditis and pericarditis is viral or bacterial infections. This means that the study authors could have inadvertently selected a control group that is likely to have a higher incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis than the general population. Another issue is the timing. Whereas data from the COVID group was collected over a period of almost 12 months, data from the control group was only collected over a period of six months. Why does this matter? Because it's possible that myocarditis in Israel has some seasonality. And if it does, collecting the data from the two groups over different months will seriously skew the results. Now, of course, there may not be any seasonality with myocarditis in Israel. We just don't know. This study showed that it had some seasonality in Finland, but obviously Finland has a very different climate than Israel. So in summary, contrary to Dr. Campbell's claims, the Israeli study does not show that COVID isn't associated with myocarditis and pericarditis. It specifically states that it is. The study is looking at the incidence in people who have already recovered from COVID. And with this restriction, it doesn't show an association. But this finding is inconsistent with the findings of a much larger study. And there are also a number of limitations that could be affecting the results. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked or commented on the video, Double thank you. 
because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And even if you've decided to leave a nasty comment or complain about me waving my arms around, it doesn't matter. That still helps the algorithm because they don't actually read what the comment says. They just say, wow, someone's made a comment. Let's show this video to more people. Anyway, enough of, enough of that and my hand waving. Ah. But I would also just like to thank everyone who has bought me a coffee. I really appreciate your support. I will be con continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to see them, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.